All right, so today we're taking notes on section 2.4, which is the library of functions. So those are all um, the parent functions that we must know their shape and their domains and ranges. Um, and then we're going to talk about piecewise functions. The first learning objective is to graph the functions listed in our library of functions. So we are going to um, look at a series of parent functions and we're going to draw the sketch in our notes and we are expected to have these in our memory bank so that's why we have a quizlet um, for these library of functions. And drawing it during these, even if you know it, drawing it during these notes will help um, to solidify it in our minds. So this is the square root function. It's f of x equals the square root of x. Uh, the x-intercept is at 0. The y-intercept is also at 0. The function is neither even or odd. It is increasing on its domain and it has a local minimum um, of 0 at x equals 0. I would also include that the domain and range are positive real numbers. Positive real numbers. Okay, so the next one we have is a cube root function. Unlike the square root function, this is numbers that multiply by itself three times to give you your output. So we need to determine whether the cube root function is even, odd, or neither. And we're going to state whether the graph is symmetric with respect to the y-axis or symmetric with respect to the origin. We're also going to figure out intercepts and then we're going to graph it. I'll give you guys a second to write this down. Alright, so when we put in negative x for x in our cube root function, um, that is the same as saying what times itself three times. So if you separate the cube root, um, if you separate the negative and make it a negative 1, on your calculators, what's the cube root of negative 1? just negative 1, right. So the cubed root of negative 1 is negative 1, so that's why it's okay to pull this negative out of the cubed root. So we can say that when we put in negative a negative value for x, we get out the same as if we just took the whole function, calculated it with a positive, and took the negative on the end. What's that a test for? Yes. Odd. This means the function is odd and symmetric with respect to the origin. Yay. All right, B. Determine the intercepts, if any, of the graph of f of x equals cubed root of x. So we plug in 0 for x. So when x is equal to 0, that tells us the y-intercept. And the cubed root of 0 is 0 so that the x and y intercepts are both zero. All right, we're going to graph this little guy. So we take some values, and the best thing to do is take values that have a perfect cube root, because if we take any other values, we'll get some wonky decimals. So the values that we've chosen are 0, 1 8, 1, 2, I'll throw in a funky cube root value here, and 8. So on our graph, we're going to graph 0, 0, 1 8, 1 half, 1, 1, and 2, 1.26, and 8, 2. And that's going to look like.
how is the cube root function related to the cube function? Right, Josh. This one's flipped on its side and mirrored. Right, so the cube root function is, it's as if um, the cubic function was mirrored and flipped on its side. So a little rotation and a little reflection, right? And at, when we look at the graph, we can see the corresponding in this coordinate 1, 1 has a matcher here in the um, third quadrant with negative 1, 1. So we can see the symmetry with respect to the origin since the, there is a corresponding third quadrant coordinate for each first quadrant coordinate. So here are the deets of the cube root function. So just write this underneath the graph that we just wrote down. Uh, we know that, we already have this written down, that the x-intercept is 0, y-intercept is also 0. The function is odd. It is increasing from negative infinity to infinity. And it does not have a local minimum or a local maximum. All right, absolute value. We need to decide if absolute value function f of x equals absolute value x is even, odd, or neither. And we're going to state whether the graph of f is symmetric with respect to the y-axis or the origin. Then we're going to determine the intercepts and graph it. You guys can definitely pare this wording down when you're writing this in your notes. So don't feel like you have to write every single word. Just the gist of what they're asking you to do is enough for notes. Okay, let's do this. When we put in negative value for x, what does the absolute value do to all negative values? Makes it positive. So it's the same, so putting in negative x into our function is the same as just putting in x, which is equal to our original function. And when we put a negative value into our function and get back out our original function, that is called even, and we have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Gives us that nice V shape. Same on the for the negative x as it is for the positive x. When we put in 0 into our absolute value function, the absolute value of 0, also known as, absolute value is also known as the distance from 0 on the number line. So if you're on a number line, how far away is 0 from 0? It is 0, 0 all the way around. So our intercept is at 0, 0. If we look at a picture, <laughs> um, I'm not terribly pleased with the numbers they picked here because what type of numbers are missing? <laughs> negative numbers, kind of an important part of this graph. So I would add a negative 1 and negative 2 to this table so that I can definitely see the graph of it. Although, I guess if you're thinking I have symmetry with respect to the x-axis, all I have to do is put my coordinates on the right-hand side and then mirror it on the left. That is also feasible, which may be what they're thinking. Maybe they're just smarter than I am. And I'm like, oh no, what does that do on the other side? Let's plug some numbers in. Okay, so here's our deets about absolute value. Uh, X-intercepts, you guys have this all down except for um, our decreasing and increasing. And I like, I definitely want you to have this information in your notes because um, it's a beautiful quiz question to say, um, take a look at this function, write down the intervals on which it's increasing and decreasing. 
<coughs> and getting used to the terminology is important. So this function is decreasing from negative infinity to zero, and it is increasing from zero to positive infinity. It has a local minimum of zero at x equals zero. So add those two things to this. All right, now you got my buddy. And it's my friend, the constant function. He is f of x equals b, where b is a real number. It is a horizontal line, and it has a y-intercept of 0, comma b. It always intercepts that b. Uh, identity function, f of x equals x. It's called the identity because <clears throat> our input is equal to our output. And we get just the same thing. So we talked a little bit about that um, with the y equals x and how it's related to absolute value. And um, this is just straight line through the origin. Slope is 1. This is the parent function to all of our linear functions. Square function, what have we called this in the past? How else have we referenced the square function? It's got a couple different names. Parabola, yes. And quadratic, yes. So we've called these quadratics. We've called these parabolas, and in this instant, um, because it matches up with our mathematical operation of squaring, we're calling this the square function. So I like to remember it as a square function is this even or odd, or neither. So think about our symmetry. What do you think, Josh? It is even. It's got symmetry with respect to the y-axis. So when I plug in 1, I get out 1. When I plug in negative 1, I get out 1. When I plug in 2, I get out 4. When I plug in negative 2, I get out 4. The square takes our negative values and gives us a positive output. So it doesn't matter whether we put in a negative or a positive, we get the same output for those two items. So this is even. cube function f of x equals x cubed it is our little swimmer he's diving right in here's his little arms and then here's his legs and he's like whoop perfect 10 dive um, cube function even odd or neither We think, we think odd. I agree. Because you look in quadrant one, this is definitely a one and three, quadrant one and quadrant three kind of function. For my input one, one, I have a matching input, negative one, or input output, negative one, negative one. And my two, this over here, I'll have a two, eight, and down here, I'll have a negative two, negative eight. We already looked at the square root function. If you already have this written down, do not write it down a second time because that would be crazy unless you really feel like you need it for your, your information to write it down a second time. Remember, our, we have a local min here. We are increasing from 0 to <coughs> infinity. We are all real numbers <coughs> that are positive for our domain and range. We already looked at the cube root function. You may write it down if, again if you feel it's necessary. I don't recommend that. <clears throat>
This one we haven't looked at in great detail yet. He's the reciprocal function. <clears throat> So uh, reciprocal function cannot equal zero. So we cannot have our input equal to zero because one over zero causes a zombie apocalypse. It's not allowed in math. Um, Armageddon and mayhem ensue, so we don't divide by zero. When we put in a one, we get an output of positive one. When we put in negative one, we got an output of negative one and from zero to infinity we are decreasing and from negative infinity to zero we are also in uh, decreasing which is interesting and then we can't, do not include zero into, this, into your intervals because you cannot equal zero. So definitely an open parenthesis, I call it a soft, a soft parenthesis versus a bracket. We talked about the absolute value function, so I'll write this down if you already have it in your notes. It's an even function, it's a V-shape. All right. This is kind of a new guy, the greatest integer function. Um, so it, we write it as f of x equals int parenthesis x. This asterisk is just to note, so you don't have to include the asterisk. Um, and it's the greatest integer less than or equal to x. The greatest integer less than or equal to x. And the best, I always find, because it's not something we use a lot, greatest integer, um, but I find that making a table and drawing the graph is the best way to square up greatest integer. So if you look at it, <clears throat> if I plug in negative one, and so any integer that I plug in will get will output that same integer. So I plug in negative one, I'm going to get out negative one. It's when we go in between those integer values. So in between like when I get out negative one half. So what you have to ask yourself, what is the integer that's less than or equal to negative one half? So on the number line, if you're at negative one half, What's the integer directly to the left of negative one half? So go ahead and I look at it like this. If you have a number line, and I'm here at negative one half, what is the integer directly to the left of negative one half? It's negative one. And the answer is right next to the problem. So. All right, so let's do that with negative one fourth. So I'm going to be here on my number line at negative one fourth. And what integer is to the left of that value? Negative one. So at zero, zero is an integer. So if I put an integer in and get that same integer out, zero, zero. Let's look at it here. If I put in one fourth, what integer is directly to the left of one fourth? Zero. So anything in between zero and one is going to push me back to zero. Anything between zero and negative one is going to push me back, my output back to negative one. So if I plug in one half, that's not an integer yet, so that pushes me back to zero. If I put in three-fourths, that's not yet one, so it pushes me back to zero. I love this picture because this is also called a step function because the picture of a in greatest integer function looks like a little set of stairs. So if you look, I can at negative one 
I can equal negative 1, so I put a closed circle. And it doesn't matter what input I get between negative 1 and 0, I'm going to get the output of negative 1. And then once I hit 0, we put an open circle, and we hop up to 0. Then I'm equal to 0 until I get to 1. I put an open circle, and we hop up to 1. And then as I'm going, I'm still equal to, my output is equal to 1 until I get to 2. And then I put an open circle and I jump up to 2. So if you use connected mode, you'll, it'll make a line in between the two um, steps, which is not accurate because our function does not include those values. Um, the dot mode, which I think everybody's default is in dot mode, um, it will show you the steps, but not the circles. All right, second learning objective. We're going to graph piecewise defined functions, and that just means we're going to piece different functions together and um, evaluate, which is definitely valid to do because life isn't always a smooth, continuous graph. Sometimes we piece together different um, rules and regulations for different um, values. And as it's getting into tax season, tax rate is a piecewise function, FYI. You make it, it's a certain tax rate until you make a certain amount, then it's a different rate. So you've got a, you know, constant line, and then it, it's an um, increasing line. And then the higher increments of money you make, the different tax rate you have. So it's different. So life is a piecewise function. OK, so here's how you guys are going to encounter it in the wild. Just like this. So from negative 1 to 1, our function is going to be negative x plus 1. And then for x equals 1, it's going to be the constant function f of x equals 2. And then for any values greater than 1, it's going to be x squared. So we are going to find f of 0, f of 1, and f of 2. We're going to determine the domain. And then we're going to graph it. And then we're going to find the range. Boop. All right, so our first one, when we put in 0, you have to look at which interval does 0 occur. And we see that for x equals 0, we have to use negative x plus 1. So this is the one we plug 0 into. So we got negative 0 plus 1, which is just equal to 1. f of 1 is this function, because x equals 1, our function is 2. And f of 2 falls in this category. So we're going to square the 2 and use this operation on it, and f of 2 is equal to 4. The domain of f, so you look at what's the smallest x value that is a part of this piecewise function, and that is negative 1, and I can include it because it's less than or equal to, so I got bracket negative 1, and I can go, because it's x values greater than 1, so I can go all the way to infinity. And since we can never actually touch infinity, we make it an open parenthesis. So the domain is between negative 1 included to infinity. When we graph it by hand, this is the graph of a line. So if I'm graphing a line, I go to positive 1, that's our intercept, and my slope is negative 1 over 1, so I go down 1 over 1, down 1 over 1. So it's this line, but i got to stop it here at negative 1 because I can't go beyond that. And then i got to put an open circle here at x equals 1 because at that point, I jump up to 2. Open circle, or sorry, closed circle at 2 because I'm equal to it. 
and then anything greater than one, so I go to my, my um, parabola or my square function, and I start my square function at my values that are bigger than one, so that means open circle here, and then parabola all the way on up. So if we look at the range, what is the smallest y value that happens in our graph? So do we go, we almost get to zero, but do we actually touch zero? So this line takes us real close to zero, but we don't actually hit zero because I've got an open circle. And when that gets real close, it jumps us up to x equals two. So our range is open parentheses zero, and then this one just goes up forever to infinity, so, so it's from zero to infinity, not included. That's our range. All right, so I printed this out. You guys, this is the problem that we printed out together, so you can just um, tape this to your notes. So we're gonna take a look at this function together. So for the first part, what is the charge using 300 kilowatt hours in a month? So our charge is going to be the 450 plus uh, 4.2345 times 300. Easy calculator to chug, it's $17.20. Now we're going to calculate it for our 1,500 kilowatt hour in a month. So for our first thousand of that 1500, it's gonna be at the cheaper rate. And then any kilowatt hours over that is gonna be the more expensive rate. So we go our 450, our 0 0.042345 for the first thousand kilowatt hours. And then at the higher rate 0 0.05, 3622 times 500 for the more expensive kilowatt hours. When we total these up in our calculator, we get $73.66. So now let's put together a nice model that relates the monthly charge in kilowatt hours used. We're going to let C be a function of X. So if X is the number of kilowatt hours, we're going to chunk it up into pieces. For zero um, to 1,000 for our X values, the monthly charge is our kilowatt hour rate plus 450. So that function looks like this. C of X equals 0 0.042345X plus 450, and then that's if x is, or, so if 0 less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 1,000. And this function applies. The second part is the harder part. So we have this, so it's this second part for when we're go over 1,000. So for x bigger than 1,000, we have the flat charge for that first 1,000 kilowatt hours plus our 450 plus our higher rate times x minus 1,000. So you, we look at what we did for 1,500. We had 500 here. Well, we had 1,500 here, so how do we get 500 when it's actually 1,500? Oh, we subtract out the first 1,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, so X minus 1,000 um, equals the usage in excess of 1,000 kilowatt hours. So our piecewise function is 46.845 plus 0 0.053 622 parenthesis x minus a thousand. We definitely can distribute this 
and you guys can't see it, but I will read it out to you. It's 0 0.053622x, so it's our rate, minus 6.777. So if we were going to graph this piecewise function, we would have a continuous line from 0 to 1,000. And then once we hit that 1,000 mark, our slope would increase since our rate increases. And we go on forever until, I guess, technically infinity but we can never touch infinity. So this is what the graph looks like. Make sure you include the graph. 